Hi, I know I'm a little later than usual, but that's on me. A lot has been happening with things like school and my own personal mental issues. I have epilepsy. But I won't let that stop me from the grind. The other reason this video took so much longer, as well as the previous, was due to a review I wrote for the newest Sufjan Stevens record, which really shouldn't have been as long as it was. But I digress. September albums, what dropped? What did I like? Let's see. To open, Slow Dive returned to their second comeback record. Not many bands can say that they've even reformed once to do a single comeback record, let alone two. Wait, am I getting deja vu? Anyway, not important. Slow Dive returned six years after their self-titled with their newest album, Everything Is Alive, which had a lot of pressure on its back. Slow Dive are no small band. They're one of the biggest names in shoegaze next to the likes of Cocteau Twins and My Bloody Valentine, so people were very excited for this album. Does it hold up against their 90s greats? I mean... I would say there's definitely a candle there. It was clear from the lead single, Kisses, that this album wasn't going to try and replicate their 90s work. And that's perfectly fine. The question really is, were the new ideas presented any good? Yeah, actually. Everything's Alive is a really nice record that feels like a lot of heart and thought was put into it. It flows amazingly, and each song feels interconnected with one another. I can hear melodies from songs on the record appear in others, and it makes paying attention feel rewarding. It's an album that's easy to get lost in, and while it definitely isn't as revolutionary as Savlaki or Pygmalion, that's fine. It's still a very good record. 9 out of 10. Key tracks are Shanti, A Life, Kisses, Chain to a Cloud, and I'm allowed to pick the closer because it was a single and you've probably already heard it, The Slab. Olivia Rodrigo returns with a sophomore album Guts, and it is miles better than her debut. But why? Or how? Listening to this and going back to Sour feels like night and day. It's clear that she has matured as an artist since Sour, as a majority of these songs sound like her own. Sour suffered from feeling bland and boring, and each song being about basically the same thing, besides the closer. But here on Guts, she spreads her wings, and while a lot of these songs are still about relationships and breakups, she shakes things up by incorporating new sounds and genres such as post-punk revival and power pop instead of relying on the same ballad each time. There are still ballads on this record. Hell, the lead single was a ballad, but she still manages to shake those up too, to make them feel unique and interesting. I think it's her general style of writing that's evolved. She's been forced to grow up much faster than most people due to her stardom, not just due to her debut album, but her growing up on the Disney Channel. She hasn't had a quote-unquote normal teenage life, and she laments about it on this record, especially in the songs Making the Bed and the closing track Teenage Dream, which is not a Katy Perry cover. All in all, this is a really good follow up and makes me really excited for what might come next. 8 out of 10. Key tracks here are Bad Idea Right, Vampire, Ballad of a Homeschooled Girl, Making the Bed, and The Grudge. I would include The Closer, but it's The Closer. I don't like making people listen to The Closer if they haven't heard the full record. Billy Woods does it again in the same year. Only four months after he released Maps, he releases We Buy Diabetic Test Strips with Euclid under the moniker Arm & Hammer. Arm & Hammer are far from a new duo. They've released plenty of revered records such as Haram, Shrines, and Paraffin. The best way to describe We Buy Diabetic's test strips is eclectic. From front to back, this thing is enjoyable, engaging, fun, incredibly well written and produced, and all around an amazing piece of work. There's so much to take in with each song and each listen as a whole. There's so much going on, but it all manages to work and never feels feel either overwhelming or out of control. I love it, and with each subsequent listen, I find more things to love. Well, not a perfect record, I will say it is slightly long, but that doesn't bother me too much. It's what's inside that counts, and inside this album is so much fun and so much raw talent. I can't really get enough of it. 8 out of 10. The key tracks are The Gods Must Be Crazy and Y'all Can't Stand Right Here. Fuck off, who is... Fucking, I fucking hate my phone. Baka is an artist that I was introduced to via a very good friend of mine who I will name drop because I want them to watch this video, Ollie. He showed me the lead single, Alive, for this record before it released and I really enjoyed it. After the album did release, it did take me a bit to eventually get to it because I had such a big backlog by that point, but once I finally did it, I found myself enjoying it a lot more than I thought I would. Before listening to Halo, I had already heard his previous record, Nobody's Home, as Ollie made me listen to it with him, and I really enjoyed that one too. Halo is an incredibly uplifting, upbeat, catchy, and just generally fun and life-affirming record that is just a reminder that every day is worth it and that you shouldn't worry about everything out of your control. A topic that was discussed a lot in his previous record, making Halo feel very much like a sister record to it. Nobody's Home was the yin and Halo is the yang. It's an album that just makes me feel good to be alive. I mean, the lead single is literally called Alive. It's difficult to write a positive album that feels genuine that doesn't come off as cheesy or cringy, at least it does in my eyes. But I feel that Bakar really pulled it off and I returned to this album really often just to feel good. 8 out of 10. The key tracks here are One In One Out, Alive, All Night, Selling Biscuits and Right Here For Now.
I've been struggling to figure out what my actual opinion on this album is. Originally, when I put it in this video, I gave it a relatively high score, but now returning to it again and again, I've sort of come to realise that I don't like it as much as I thought I did. So, let's delve into why. First and foremost, this album is too long. I'm sorry, I said it. But it does not need to be nearly a hundred minutes in length. For an album that is very clearly meant to be listened to in one sitting as you let the sounds and ideas envelop you, it doesn't do enough to actually warrant me to want to do that. The first half of this album, tracks 1-4, to four, are really solid and I enjoy them all, especially track 4, Martin for Error, which I think is the best song on the record and one of the highlights of the year. It's a really good bookend to the first half and would be a good place to cut the track list in half and make a double album. But that's not what's done here. The album goes straight into the next song we keep chugging along. It's fine though, as the following track The Commercial Nude is also an incredible song that highlights the strength this album has. It's the following track where things start to get brought down. After this point I started noticing how long was left of songs and things began to drag. Ideas grew old and I wanted to be done with the whole thing. That would be fine if the album ended only the track 6 or 7 but it doesn't. There's still another 24 minute song at the end which is by far the weakest. It starts off incredibly strong but by the 13 minute mark it already feels like it's overstayed its welcome. And then it goes on and on and I could go on and on. But I won't. This is an album that has some great ideas and some great structure. That structure is just completely covered by the, deliberate or not, pretentiousness of the album. 6 out of 10. Key tracks are Margin for Error and The Commercial Nude. Mitski returns quite soon after her previous record, only a year after Lorella Hell, we receive The Land is Inhospitable and So Are We, which, to put it lightly, seems to be Mitski not giving a fuck anymore. And I love it. One of the biggest issues a lot of people had with Laurel Hell was that it felt like Mitski quote unquote selling out. She only really made the record because she felt as if she had to and you could tell she wasn't extremely happy. I mean the lead single Working for the Knife is literally about working for money and other people rather than yourself and passion. I was expecting Laurel Hell to be her final album so I was incredibly surprised to see this drop but I am so glad it did because this is one of the best things she has ever done by far. The Land is Inhospitable is an Americana alt country indie folk inspired record that doesn't care for a lot of the quote-unquote standards Mitski has set in her other records. Gone are the standard verse-chorus-verse structures and instead we receive much more lyrically heavy and dense songs that require you to properly sit and listen. The instrumentation too is much more lush and orchestral than anything she's done before. It really feels like she's doing whatever makes her happy and I love that. The songwriting on this record is some of the best since Puberty 2 and some of it is on par with her best songs. Tracks like I Don't Like My Mind, My Love All Mine, Star and I'm Your Man are all beautifully written not just lyrically but instrumentally too. But especially I'm Your Man. That song is flabbergasting. Is that even a word? Mitski has practically reinvented herself here and I'm so excited to hear what comes next from this. 9 out of 10. Key tracks are Bug Like an Angel, I Don't Like My Mind, The Deal, My Love All Mine, Star, and I'm Your Man. So a lot, but she just had to make one of the best albums of the year. Sorry. 13 years after the tragic passing of Mark Linkers, we receive a posthumous album in the form of Bird Machine, one which I wasn't expecting at all but gladly accept as Bird Machine is an incredibly solid entry into Linkers' discography as a whole. I wouldn't call anything here truly groundbreaking or better than his best work, it's a wonderful live in Viva Dixie, but it definitely has tracks that stand up there with some of his best. The second single, Evening Star Supercharger, reminds me heavily of classic Sparkle Horse and reminds me of everything I love about Linkers' work. It all invokes a sense of melancholic nostalgia that that really only he manages to encapsulate. It's a mix of his vocals and songwriting that comes together to create a place to get lost in for a period, to forget about life and the sorrows around you. While this isn't a happy record, especially considering the newly given context of it, I would still recommend it if you're a fan of his previous work, and if you've never listened to any of Linkus' work before, go listen to It's a Wonderful Life, then come back to this. 8 out of 10. The key tracks are Evening Star Supercharger, Daddy's Gone, Chaos of the Universe, and Skull of Lucia. It surprised me when I found out that Time Skiffs actually released two years ago. It feels like it was only last year we were jamming out to those psychedelic jams. Probably because it was last year. I was completely wrong when I wrote that. I don't know why I thought it was two years ago, but either way, the band returned with what I can only describe as the sister album to Time Skiffs, Isn't It Now? If Time Skiffs was Animal Collective's return to a more psychedelic pop sound, Isn't It Now is their return to their more folkedelic side? That should be the genre name instead of psychedelic folk, it sounds so much better. A lot of these songs wouldn't go amiss on their earlier works such as Sung Tongs or Campfire Songs, while still incorporating the good elements from albums such as Painting With and Tangerine Reef. The ambient elements on show are much more apparent, but are made interesting and actually enjoyable with interesting melodies and fun lyrics, and even on the much more ambient track, 
back, such as the 22 minute behemoth defeat, they still managed to leave me hypnotized and wanting more with its slow build up towards nothing. But it works. Animal Collective have seemingly managed to find their psychedelic roots again and have gone full force with it now, and I love it. I'm really excited to see what the future holds for them. 8 out of 10. The key tracks here are Magicians from Baltimore, Defeat, and Stride Right. Ozara Kimishima returned to the second album of the year in No Public Sounds, and it's a real doozy. Everything about this is just incredibly solid and enjoyable. I wouldn't call it anything incredibly special or important, but it's definitely an album worth checking out if you're itching for some arty noise pop. All of these songs are really well structured, and there are some huge standouts such as Crazy and the closing track, which I can't pronounce because it's in Korean. All I can really say is that this is a very good record. Go check it out. 8 out of 10. The key tracks are all on screen because um, I can't pronounce any of them. They're all in Korean. Sorry. Underscore has released one of my favourite albums from 2021, so I was extremely excited to see what she had in store this time. After hearing the lead single, Cops and Robbers, I knew we were going to be in for something special, but I don't think I ever could have prepared myself for just how special this record is going to be. Wall Socket is more than just an album. It's a full-on ARG with world building done through the music videos and even external websites scattered that had to be found by fans. April went all out for this album because you can tell she's really proud of it. Every single song in here is a hit, not a single miss anywhere. This thing is tight, catchy, fun, emotional, and just an absolute joy to sit through. For its near hour runtime, it does not feel anywhere near that length, but with each listen I get surprised when I reach the closer as it goes by so quickly. There is so much to dive into on this record, and I can't do it justice here. You can read my review for it in the description, as with every album here, if you want a much more in-depth opinion and explanation on the album. What I can say here, though, is that this album is a strong 10 out of 10. An album that I didn't expect to hit me as hard as it did. An album that tackles themes such as growing up alongside the internet and its dangers, romance, abuse, toxicity, self-harm, suicide, eating disorders, and self-image issues. Soft Scars is not an easy record to listen to, even with its incredibly poppy and outwardly happy sounding tone, something that isn't incredibly far off from Kiriko Bonito on their record Time and Place. I was absolutely blown away by Soft Scars, especially having never listened to Yule prior to this record. This isn't something for everyone, and I've already seen many people disregard this album as, ooh, I'm so wacky and crazy bullshit. But this is something truly special. Truly vulnerable. Truly visceral. This is an incredibly real album coming from a place of trauma and hurt. This isn't a vent piece or a cry for help, it's an expression of art, and art is the truest way to express any emotion. Yule has created something truly beautiful in Soft Scars, and something I cannot recommend enough. 10 out of 10. Key tracks, I mean, if I have to pick favourites then, For You, I Won Two, Daisies, and Softer Update. And that's just because they're the songs that hit me the hardest. And next up, of course, we have all of the singles that I enjoyed. There weren't any standout EPs for me this month, but hopefully next time there will be. Either way, let's talk about some more music. We have a banger of an opener with Poppy's newest single. Now this is how you make a sexual song. On Motorbike, Poppy sings explicitly about how much she wants to ride with a girl and see what's between her legs. It's a song seeping with energy. It's similar in style to her previous single, Knock Off, but with an even bigger emphasis on the dance pop. There's a lot going on, but it works. It's infectious and makes me feel like a whore for singing along, but I don't care. Go girl. Haunting is the first word that comes to my mind. I mean, it's Kristen Hater, why wouldn't that be the first word? Beautiful was the second. It's funny how those two words very often appear next to each other when describing any of her work. I Will Be With You Always is a gorgeous song that highlights Hater's angelic yet haunting singing voice. While it's no Pennsylvania furnace, it makes up for what it lacks in grandeur in lyrical content and style. Continuing with the style of the previous single, this song once again feels like a hymn discovered from a long forgotten record, like listening to a ghost pressed to wax. Opening with some wonderful acoustic guitars to harken back to those old days, we're thrown into something that I can only describe as sweet trip-esque. Wind Tunnels, Coming South's grand return to music after they'd announced their breakup, is definitely one hell of a comeback. Kim went off to release their newest single, which I covered in my previous video, and that song was quite the change from their previous style. It seems like Coming South, which consists of Kimmy Sanchez on vocals and instrumentation, and Approaching Mountains on production since, had a similar maturity. Wind Tunnel sounds nothing like their previous work, but it's an excellent new direction to go in, and I adore it. The release of Kim's revised version of Summer's Pause last month felt like the perfect way to turn the page on this chapter for both themselves and this group.
The only thing I can really say about the song is that it is absolutely gorgeous and absolutely perfect. I could say so much more about this song, but I don't think it could do it any justice. At least not now. Sufjan is one of the best songwriters of the century, of any century in fact, and he only continues to prove that. He is beautiful and I can only hope the best for him. To close, we have one of my favourite songs from this entire year, and still is. The title track from Jane Rivers' upcoming, now released, album, Census Designated, shows what an amazingly talented artist Jane truly is, with harrowing lyrics alongside its brutal production. The noise is sickly sweet and I can feel the blood dripping from my mouth. This is a song to be played at max volume and screamed along to. To say that Jane is an immensely talented artist would have been an understatement. She is a goddess. And that's that. That's the end of my September video. I'm sorry that it's out uh, basically in New Year's, but I'm hoping to quickly get through the next couple videos of months, so October and November, and then I will have the 2022 video up and also the 2023 video up, obviously referring to my favourite albums of those years. Uh, because I have plans for both. If you've seen my Twitter, you will know. But don't worry, everything is still being done. I have just been busy with college and I've been depressed and stuff. But either way, I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, sorry it's late, but I'm not dead. That's good. And I hope you found something good to listen to. And everything will be in the description. All the links to the albums and the reviews that I've written. It might be structured a bit differently because BitLies changed how they work things and it's really annoying, bitly, bit lie, whatever. They've changed how they do links and stuff, so I've had to find a different way to do it. I'm not entirely sure how I'm going to do it yet as I'm recording this, so you'll just have to see when you look down there. Either way, I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope you got something out of it, because that's all I really want from making these, is that you find something new to listen to and enjoy that thing. Good morning, good afternoon, good night.